Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Today is episode number 24, and it's going to be a little bit of a review of the book of Colossians. And I'm going to give you 10 and a half reasons to read the book of Colossians. So we finish reading Colossians, and I'm kind of standing back and asking the question, well, why would I read this? I've told you at the beginning <laughs> that that this could be your favorite book. It might be your favorite book. Why? What's the, what's the big deal about Colossians? Why should I read it if you haven't read it and you're starting with the conclusion, which is not a bad place to start? All right, here's reason number one. You should read Colossians because you'll meet a guy named Epaphras. Now, he's a guy who we find that was from uh, Colossae and now was with Paul in Rome, and he's a guy who struggles for them. Well, the crazy thing is he's in prison, and he is struggling on behalf of the Colossians from afar, um, and you might have people out there in your world that are struggling from struggling for you. Maybe they're family, maybe they're friends, maybe it's somebody in your church or your neighborhood. You might have people out there who are struggling on your behalf, and we'll get to the point eventually that you could struggle on their behalf. All right, so why might, uh, number two, why might uh, someone struggle uh, for you. Well, here's the thing is you are in the struggle. You, the struggle you're in is to walk in a manner worthy. That is to stand mature, to be complete, to increase in knowledge. And the call is to join people that are, that are in that struggle. And so the, the idea with, with the, that's in Colossians is, you know, sort of keeping the main thing, the main thing, which is walk in a manner worthy, be mature, grow up, you know, fill, fulfill your call, do your purpose, and, and stay on stay on task. That's reason number two. The third reason you should read Colossians is you will meet Jesus uniquely in the book of Colossians as a creator. So this is one of his main jobs. It's his big one of the big things on his on his resume. So after you know coming down and saving the world and everything. We find in Colossians of like, oh, by the way, creation. Oh, yeah, I did that too. Oh, uh, you know, creating something or or somewhere that never existed before, or maybe creating a baby, someone I, that some some person that didn't exist before. He gives everything their beginning, and uh, you know, ultimately, then he's going to actually going to you know keep keep doing new things and he's going to be the firstborn from the dead he's going to give the give the resurrection to us too he's going to sort of create uh a death problem and create a resurrection that's going to get us out of the out of that that trouble as he's the firstborn from the dead so you're going to meet Jesus as creator number 4 then after creating everything and starting things as at the beginning then he holds everything together and i think this you know in, in my mind i think this is all the atom, atomic power that's being you know held in check in every atom and neutron electron flying around it you know i think we just have to tap the tip our hat to him as he's holding our world together even right now so not only did he make it but he's holding it together number five I think we should be in awe and in subjection and obedience. Well, that's the good news. The problem is we kind of, by our bent and our, the evil in our hearts, we're hostile and we're enemies to God. And we, we end up sort of hating him and, and, and re- rebelling against him. So what's the big fix? Well, the other thing we learn, not only is creator, not only is he holding things together, but he's this reconciler where he takes these hostile people and he brings them into a relationship where he can be homaging the, the, the Lord and from enemies to extolling him and reconciling the hateful that, that eventually people can bow the knee and honor him. So he turns us from rebels to uh, reverencers, you know, so he is a reconciler. That's number five. Number six is that Christ chooses to come down to us. That's Emmanuel. For us, that's the sacrifice. He comes down in us. That's the intimacy that he gives us. And he chooses to be found by us so that we can choose him to be found in us. Let me say that again. God chooses to be found by us. So we can choose him to be found in us. So God chooses us first that we can choose him. All right, so how does he do that? How does Paul march this the truth? The six and a half 
is that he normalizes effort. So Paul says, I toil, I struggle, I, I work with his energy, and so do I. I cooperate with the Christianity, and then he powerfully works in me. So if Christianity makes you tired, you're in good company. All right, so when should I struggle? Well, the seventh thing is I should be struggling so that I conclude with seeing you in good order, arranged like the ar- like an army, arranged into the dis- disposition of an effective army. And what is that? So Paul is saying, until I see you in battle array, that is struggling effectively for what? For the struggle of others. So in other words, this is spiritual reprodu- reproductions uh, that a person matures to the point that they are in the battle for uh, for other people. So keep in the battle, encouraging the heart, knit the hands together, and shoot for spiritual maturity. Number eight, let's, let's all understand that the walk with him is risky. There are those out there that want to take us captive, thwart our walks in, with deceitful philosophies. But here's the thing. Our walk with him is sufficient. The fullness of Christ dwells with us. And the intimacy, the walk with him is intimate. So we find that though it's risky and there's there's trouble, we are accompanied. We are attached. We are filled with him. The fullness of God resides in us. And and he is able. We already went through that. For heaven's sakes, he holds creation all together. The, you know, the least he can do is uh, help, help us people that he's promised to do. The ninth reason is one of our problems is our big sin. Remember, we have this big Santa list. Well, we have this record of death. Well, this we talked about this before, but he's a reconciler, and our record of debt gets canceled. Our trespasses gets forgiven. Our legal demands are obliterated. And this, the accusations, he, he disarms them. Um, Satan is accusing us before the throne, and Christ says, for, for what? I, I forgave them. So this he set aside was the big was the big word from that. And then finally, he points us towards not shadows, but towards substance. So how do I grow is the idea. We'll love him, love the word, love his people, and love his wisdom. So these, ladies and gentlemen, are ten and a half reasons to read the book of Colossians. I'll give you a couple more tomorrow. Thanks for listening.